we have reached the first draft here in our draft only franchise on MLB The Show 24. The best time in really any franchise series, but particularly a draft only one. This is by far the best opportunity we have every year to get better. I have built out a pretty robust big board and I kind of want to talk to you about some of my favorite guys throughout it starting of course at the number one spot I previewed him at the end of last episode but Rafael Murillo is an absolute stud and he really doesn't have a weakness other than the fact that he's not super fast especially for a shortstop but he can play second or third spots where his speed will be just fine and I honestly think he could play shortstop as well you see shortstops in the league who aren't all that fast as long as they're good enough fielders to do it and I think he could be that but even more impressive than his defense is going to be his offense he can hit for contact he can hit for power he can get good on base he can draw the walks Injury risk being an average, you don't really know where that lies. You can see that go pretty much all over the map, so that's one thing to look out for him. We'll have to be sure to see what that is um, should we take him, but I think he's far and away the best player in this class, accurately ranked at the number one spot by our scouts. After that, there's kind of a pool of five players that I would uh, think of Pretty similarly, Morgan Villarreal is injured though. Um, does it show that here? It says injury risk low. I don't know if it shows on his play card, player card that he is injured, but he is injured. So that's why he's kind of in that last spot among these five. Not really gonna take him, but I'm interested to see what his, in what his ratings end up being because I think he's a really solid looking player. Just the fact that he's injured scares me a bit to take him, you know, with the number three pick. My next favorite player in the class is Brian Doe here, center fielder, 18 years old. He's a small guy, five foot seven, 172 pounds, but, but despite that, don't get it twisted, he can absolutely hit for power. Excels better against lefties than righties, as you would you know, expect from a right-handed hitter, but he also has some speed. Also a really good fielder. The only problem with this guy is he has a noodle arm, and he's not gonna be a very high average on base player so he certainly has stuff to work on pretty much everybody except for Murillo does in this draft so um because he's a discovery prospect there's a chance he's available at 37 and if he is and we can get my favorite two players in the class that would be an absolute haul but in case Murillo goes one or two he's certainly kind of in this group of five probably my favorite but I could be convinced otherwise Starting with a guy like Ronald Castillo, I think I, he would be my next favorite player here. I just really like the combination of velocity, break, and stamina that I see from him. Not going to have the highest walks per nine, but I don't think it's going to be so low that it's going to be, you know, a major problem that carries with him throughout his career. Only needs is a couple good seasons limiting walks, and I think that can be in a good spot. He has a five pitch mix and like a legitimate one. It's not one of those where it has four seam, two seam, or and sinker, you know, I'll just variants of the fastball he has a legitimate five pitch mix he's 18 years old has a good potential range i like this player a lot Rene bautista is the guy that can easily project to be a leadoff hitter for a franchise unfortunately offers so little on the defensive end that it's hard to see him ever becoming a defensive asset that seems pretty much impossible but it's going to be difficult even getting him to be an average type defender and he also doesn't provide power but what he does provide the contact the speed the base running the plate skills he offers in a big big way i think he's also worthy of a top five selection in this class then lastly we have henry tanana he is number two by our scouts the only reason i have him a little bit further down the board is just hits per nine and home runs per nine are such glaring weaknesses with him especially hits per nine that I think that's something that can be taken advantage of. I mean, that low of hits per nine, I think it could come back to bite him in his career. Three pitch mix, but a solid three pitch mix. And um, I think he's going to be good wherever he goes. I just don't think it will be to us unless he lasts to 37. You know, he is MLB ranked 32. 
that could last to 37 and I could be much more easily convinced of a guy like Henry Tanana at 37 than I could at three. He also is very interested in signing. Further down the board, there's a couple guys I really like, but the biggest riser in the class is Johnny Brennan. He's 92 on the MLB board. He's number nine for hours. Has a four pitch mix here, throws pretty hard and has good break on that. Uh, home runs per nine is a little bit low on him though, which is the problem, but he's a guy that we could potentially get a little bit down the board. And if he slides to say pick or pick in the seventies, that's going to be something I'm very interested in. And Richard Chen is a guy who I initially was going to be very interested in. And he just ended up getting passed up, but going to be a solid power hitter. I want to see his ratings after the draft. Not going to be taken by us, but I am interested in where he goes. Michael McGaffick is one of my very favorite players for us to take in one of those two picks in that 37 to 41 slot. Maybe he makes it to 79. We could try and be aggressive that way. It kind of just depends on who makes it to 37 and 41. But he's a guy who just has excellent velocity stamina. His home runs per nine are going to be really high. That's something I'm really looking at here. He's going to throw, you know, an upper 90s fastball potentially with a curveball changeup and cutter off of it. Um, guaranteed high B potential as well and guaranteed to be kind of in the mid to high 60s with his overall. That's something that I really like. Also, 98% interested in us. I don't know if I've ever had somebody that high in the history of me playing this game, which isn't a very long history to be fair. Jeff Ramirez here is a closer that I think if we can get in those middle rounds, we're talking third, fourth round, absolutely going to be somebody that I'll be taking a look at. High walks per nine and strikeouts per nine, solid velocity and break, four seamer, two seamer, curveball and slider, 21 years old. I like Jeff Ramirez a decent bit. Kyle Brown is somebody that we scouted. Uh, the very last week to get him up to 100%, and he ended up rising up the boards a bit, which puts him in play probably as early as 41, but if he's there at 79, he's going to be somebody that's on the short list for sure. Good contact player, good play skills, and good defender. Really gives you pretty much everything except for the power. He's a little bit older, of course, but he's also going to be potentially a mid to maybe even high 60s overall player which I think mitigates the risk of taking older players as long as they're a little bit further along in their development. So I like Kyle Brown a lot. He is somebody that we could potentially get as a position player in the mid rounds. That's something that's rare based on the way I scout. Usually the mid and late rounds are pitcher filled. So if we can get a position player, I'm all for it. Ton Yeager, another guy that we spent our last week drafting, only got him to 50%. But I really like, again, seeing very high home runs per nine. I like that. Also is a good strikeout pitcher. Doesn't throw very hard is the one thing that uh, would maybe make you a little bit hesitant. But if you can get him later on in the draft, that's not going to be much of a problem. And then Dominique Flores here. Really, really high hits per nine. Gets you kind of excited if you can get him later on in the draft. Uh, some of his weaknesses, including in not really having a great pitch mix or throwing that hard makes him somebody that I probably wouldn't consider until the last couple picks of the draft. But if he's there, I think he at least has some strengths, namely hit per nine, that will make him an interesting pick. And that'll wrap up here the preview portion of the draft episode. Let's get into the draft itself. The Guardians hold the number one pick. In the draft, and with the selection, they will take Felipe Nieves, number 11 on the MLB draft rank. We had him 100 spots below that projected ranking. Quite a bit of difference there. And then the Reds up at number two, they take Cesar Arturo, somebody who we didn't scout, but looks like he could at least potentially be very good at that center field spot now. Up at number three, I really wish this was something that could have some drama, but the obvious number one pick for the Colorado Rockies is Rafael Murillo, 
the shortstop who is just an incredible player. I mean, look at this card. He has really no weaknesses. It's going to combine being pretty close to MLB ready with a really high ceiling as well. Hopefully A, but probably at least low B. This guy is going to be an absolute beast for us, and I'm excited to add a true stud into the infield. He can play multiple spots in it. Richard Chen would end up going number six to the Kansas City Royals, so they get a really good power prospect. There can't do much else, though. The number one consensus player off the board here at number 10 to the Nationals. I think he's a bit overrated, but we'll see if that turns out to be the case. Ethan Shell here at number 14 is a pretty interesting player. He's very old, 23. He's an old player to come out of the draft, but guaranteed high B potential with, you know, high 60s, low 70 overall. Rene Bautista, one of our favorites in the class, going to the Milwaukee Brewers. I mean, just your prototypical leadoff hitter of the future. I think that's going to be a fun pick for Milwaukee. Ronald Castillo here. My pick for best pitcher in this class is off the board to the Rays. So I think they got themselves very good value at 18. And then Morgan Villarreal to the Blue Jays. Somebody who I think can be very, very good. It just all depends on how much his injury ends up affecting his ratings because... Based off this player card, he looks really talented. Kurt Kellenberger is a solid pitcher for the Braves for sure. Um, Was going to be in play at 37 or 41, depending on how the board fell. I did like other pitchers, but should be good. And then the Padres find themselves pretty good prospect here. 22 years old, but guaranteed at least high B potential and to be in the 60s overall. That's a pretty good start. Especially picking all the way down at number 25. I think you take that all the day. And the Phillies end up going Henry Tanana, the number two player on our scouts boards. Going to have a couple of glaring weaknesses, but our scouts really love that pick for Philadelphia. And then here at 29, Dominique Flores, the pitcher with really high hits per nine off the board to the Diamondbacks. That'll bring us up on the clock here at number 37. Once again, I wish there was more drama to this pick, but somebody that was in play for us at number three overall remains on the board. If we can get a second player here that hits with real power potential, you're just going to take that opportunity, and that's what Brian Doe offers. Also has great speed. He has a lot more weaknesses to his game than the guy we took at number three overall, but that's why he's here at 37. Brian Doe, center fielder. Welcome to the Colorado Rockies. I think we've absolutely nailed our first two selections. Just a few picks later, we are on the board at 41, and now we have some intrigue here. There are four players at the top of my board who I all have in the same tier, and that's the tier that I would be really excited to take them in this range. Johnny Brennan here, an 18-year-old pitcher. Uh, Michael McGaffick, a 22-year-old pitcher. We know a lot more about him. And Jeff Ramirez, a closer here. I have a tough time imagining we'll take a closer when we have really good starters available. And then Kyle Brown, we could really get three position players, but I think it's between these two starters as we have drafted a couple of position players at the top. It's time to really add to the pitching rotation. I think we have two excellent options. They're very different players, but which one is more valuable? That's the question we got to ask now. No guarantee that either will be there at pick 79. And with the 41st pick in the draft, we will select Michael McGaffick, just very comfortable with his ranges. Home runs per nine are very good as well. At 79, it turns out none of the guys that we had in that tier are off the board. Brennan, Ramirez, and Brown all still available at pick 79. I have a hard time thinking closers the pick with more valuable positions on the board, especially 
very strong players at those positions. Kyle Brown was certainly very tempting here, but ultimately decided to go with the top 10 player on the board in Brennan. Pick 109, and surprisingly enough, Kyle Brown remains on the board. Past pick 100, we can still get a position player who has a really well-rounded game, needs to work on his power for sure, but other than that, this guy is going to be really good, this 22-year-old player. I'm stoked to get him at 109. 139, and Ramirez is still here. This is the best luck I've had in my Discovery Scouts ever. Like, nobody else discovered these guys. I'm still picking top 20 players on my board in the fifth round of the draft. And then at pick 169, one guy left on our board, reliever Maury Lozano. Did not scout him, but he looks pretty good. Looks to throw the ball hard. So, in the sixth round, absolutely going to take a shot on him, but just want to make sure no better options. There is one other guy higher ranked, but I don't like what I see there. And then Ernesto Carvajal, solid, but he's about 50 spots down the board. So I think Lozano has to be the pick here at six, completing what I think is a very, very strong draft class for the Colorado Rockies. I mean, how did we get all these players? It took all the way until round six to pick somebody that I wouldn't have been happy to take at 41 in the draft which is just insane. And you take a look at it. Everybody's got high interest in the team as well. I'm not going to be a, a problem to sign this class, especially McGaffick and 98% interest. Just, you know, I thought we were very prepared for this draft class and turned out even better than, I had hoped I had some game plans mocked up of who we could get where, and this just exceeded my hopes in every way. I mean, nobody else discovered Kyle Brown or Jeff Ramirez is insane, and it helped us have what I think is going to be a stacked draft class. Now it's time to sign this draft class again. I don't imagine we'll have very many problems to do so. We get the first guy off the board. He had 98 in interest. Didn't need to raise that up at all. So let's continue to see who else we can get signed here. Not getting everybody in this first period, unfortunately, but we're going to get close, I think. My, my, I mean, my goodness, with the amount of interest we have. Of the first period, and we already have most of our class signed. We had two guys reject, and then we can't quite offer to Murillo until we get above 50%. So we'll get that after just one week here. Let's see if we can sign this class in just two sessions. That would be probably my record. I mean, that would be impressive indeed. Can't get Doe to sign with us once more, even though his interest is quite high. Let's try with Brennan now, see if we can't get him and we... Rejected once more. Okay, let's see if we can get Murillo on the first try. And there you have it. It's going to take a third session to get these final two guys. They're being a little greedy here. Here we go. One guy down, and we get everybody signed in three periods. What a haul. Next episode, we've got ourselves the trade deadline, which means we will be trading Nolan Jones in the start of next episode. And I've officially narrowed it down to two prospects that I'm considering, mostly because they fit roles that I don't think we have and they're division opponents, which I just think trading Nolan within the division will be fun because it'll make the division better. And I'm always up for making my division harder. If you've seen some of my past series, especially my Madden series, I like to make the division as big of a challenge as I can. So, number one of the two prospects I will be considering trading for Nolan Jones is Ethan Salas here, catcher from the Padres. Only 18 years old, one of the best rated prospects in baseball. I believe he's the number two prospect in baseball right now. Excellent defense. His speed at catcher is a really big 
point in his favor. A lot of these catchers have speed in like the 30s or 40s. He's got 74 speed, so he can be an asset. You know, coming around the base pass doesn't need to be pinch hit forever. Um, not that there are a lot of good pitch runners uh, or catchers, but his offense is in a spot where it still needs a lot of development, but I don't think it's in a spot where it's going to take too incredibly long for him to come along, especially against righties. I think he's looking pretty decent here. He is not on the Padres 40-man roster, which is, of course, a big deal. Um, and hasn't been great at the AAA level so far, but he hasn't played the whole season there. He started uh, he's in AA, I would assume, because he's only played 34 games, 140 at-bats so far. But so far, coming up across the board, looks like a pretty good season of development for him, and I think he would be an awesome catcher. Now, we do have Drew Romo, but I mean... Ethan Salas, as it stands right now, is, what, seven overall better and four years younger and with a much higher ceiling. Romo, I don't know if his offense is ever going to come along, and I think might just be destined with that really low B potential to be a really good backup catcher, whereas Ethan Salas will be one of the best, if not the best, consensusly the best, actually, catching prospect in baseball. The only one that's really close is Harry Ford, who is also a really fast catcher here and would be another cool trade target for sure um i just i'm gonna give the tiebreaker to setting nolan jones in the division the other player that i am considering is drew jones for the arizona diamondbacks um he's a player who has excellent speed 91 speed has the kind of arm you're looking for in the outfield i think he can be a long-term center fielder Offensively, he's a little bit farther away from, than Salas, but I think, you know, has the ability to play a really important defensive position really well. We have some outfielders, but, you know, with Jordan Beck going down to see potential in this draft, uh, sorry, in this season, that kind of opens the door for us to think of another long-term outfield player. We have Zach Veen. He's kind of a corner outfielder, so Drew Jones would be a good pick. We also, of course, drafted Brian Doe, but with that arm, I think he's probably destined for left field. So I think there's still room in this organization very easily for Drew Jones' skill set. So a couple of hours, I'd say, after sometime later in the day, when I, whenever I release this episode, I'll be releasing a poll for you to vote Drew Jones or Ethan Salas, or if you strongly feel that we should be trading for somebody else, you can let me know that as well. Unfortunately, Jackson Holiday has been added to the 40-man roster for the Orioles, so the number one prospect in baseball will not be available for us, but uh, Salas is the number two, so uh, we could get as high as the number two prospect in baseball. I mean, if I go look right now at top prospects. Yes, he's still listed at two. Drew Jones listed at six. So we're talking about two high, high end prospects, but I think they're worth it. I have checked. Both teams would accept the trade. Nolan Jones is 25 years old, 90 overall, and four years of team control after this year. So I think he'd be worth a ton of value. I think he would be worth Salas or Drew Jones pretty easily. So Again, I'll put it in a poll, or you could let me know in the comment section below your thoughts on who we should trade Nolan Jones, or I'll be paying attention to both the comments and the poll. So it's now officially time to take a look at the draft picks. And I know you might be thinking, you just said the trade deadline was next episode. How are you looking at the draft picks now? Basically, I saved my franchise here on the 30th. So next time I load in, it will still be the 30th and before the trade deadline. We'll make our Nolan Jones move there. But I wanted to end this episode off by taking a look at our draft class. And oh my gosh. This looks incredible. Wow. Blue potential, which is high 80s minimum, all the way down the board. Now, we don't have a ton of A, right? A lot of these are high Bs. 
But still, this is an incredible looking draft so far. Let's hop into each individual person. Rafael Murillo is 75 overall. He has 70 power versus righties off rip. 60 contact, 70 power versus righties. 68 contact, 69 power. Nice versus lefties. All of his plate skills are in the mid 50s. His fielding is 65, arm 63. The one thing though, his durability is 41, so it's not great. We're probably gonna have to train up his durability so that he can play more games and avoid injury. That's unfortunate. That durability is like the only thing keeping this from an insane, like perfect prospect. Wow. This guy's nuts. I I don't think I saw any player that wasn't a generational prospect that was as good as this guy in the last game. Rafael Murillo, man, looks insane. I'm excited to get this guy onto the squad. Brian Doe. Take a look at him. 66 overall, 89 potential. Only 29 contact versus rights. That is very low. Needs to work on the contact. Needs to work on the plate skills. Needs to work on the arm strength. We knew all that. 71 power versus lefties. 60 power versus righties. He can field. He can run. I like Brian Doe. Where does he play for us? I have no idea. We don't need to know that yet. We'll figure that out as it goes along. But I want to trade his plate skills and I want to train his arm. Which one are we going to actually do? Probably his arm will be the first thing that we train. I don't know. I don't know. Certainly a kind of a skill set that has... It's either like above 60 or below 40 in pretty much all of his skills, which is a very interesting skill set. We're going to have to work on his weaknesses, but his strengths are MLB, MLB caliber strengths already. But his weaknesses are needs five years to develop weaknesses. Interesting player. I still think it's an awesome pick, and I'm excited to see what he can do for our franchise. Michael McGaffick, 67 overall, 88 potential. Unfortunately, really low pitcher clutch. That's just a rating you don't get to see in the scouting profiles, which they would add it. 63 home runs versus uh, home runs per nine is great. 62 hits per nine is really good. But as soon as you get somebody in the scoring position, that gets replaced by clutch, which is really low. He's got 86 stamina. Velocity is uh, 78. So his fastball ends up in the lower range of what it was projected to be, unfortunately. I think his projection was 93 to 98. Ends up being 94. I was hoping for a little bit higher. Hoping for that 95, 96 range. But it's still, you know, obviously good enough. Mid, mid 90s fastball. And has that high home runs per nine that we were looking at. Johnny Brennan. So our scouts like Brennan a lot more than McGaffick. Um, probably just had to be age related because McGaffick has both better potential and is much better now. 39 home runs per nine is pretty low here, but high walks per nine, probably going to simulate well. Now this guy can throw hard. He's got the 97 mile an hour fastball. Velocity break, really good spot. Stamina is a bit low though. Something that you'll probably have to train up a bit with him. But another exciting, you know, 18 year old pitcher to add to the squad. Kyle Brown, 69 overall, nice with 88 potential. And we got him outside of the top 100 in this draft. There were 100 players drafted before Kyle Brown. I mean, if you ever needed an advertisement for why you should be discovering every single week, you can in the MLB draft. This draft was it. Doe, Discovery, McGaffick, Discovery, Brown, Discovery, Ramirez, Discovery. And Lozano, Discovery. Which he's, you know, he's not amazing, but he's really good for this sixth round. Brennan and Marie Murillo are the only guys 
ranked by MLB. We had to discover everyone else. But anyway, let's hop into Kyle Brown's player card here. Durability, not a concern with him. 95 durability. I'd like to see that after seeing some lower durabilities on our other guys. His, 16, his, uh, his fielding sub is all in the 60s. I can't speak right now. But his contact is in a good spot as well. Clutch is really good at 78. And then vision and discipline as well. So he can really do everything except for power. Power something that we're going to have to try to develop with him for sure. But I mean, really good player. Outside of the top 100. Really, really good player here in Kyle Brown. We got two awesome, awesome infielders. A little bit different skill sets. You know, Murillo's on a totally different stratosphere, power-wise. But apart from the power, they're actually really similar players. And the power is what separates, you know, a guy going three overall versus a guy going outside the top 100. Also, not being ranked by the MLB certainly helped in Kyle Brown's case. Jeff Ramirez, 64 overall, 90 potential, 73 strikeouts per nine. He's got a mid-90s fastball. I think he certainly has future closer potential. 41 home runs per nine. Gonna need to come up quite a bit. If you're gonna be a closer at Coors, but I think he's an obvious future prominent, you know, bullpen arm, if not closer. So awesome pick in the fifth round of the draft. All these guys have at least 86 potential and the exception of Brennan here are at least, what, 65 overall, 64. And then in the very last uh, round of the draft, we still got a guy that's 64 overall. His potential is just not quite there. Probably more of a kind of mid middle reliever, maybe a setup man at some point. He does throw pretty hard here. And his per nines are all at least 55, which is actually pretty good. His control is his main thing. That is an issue. Clutch also not great, but this is one of the best drafts I've done in MLB The Show. And you love to see a very strong draft in year one of a franchise. It sets you up for success in the future years. And this is absolutely a very good draft. Oh my goodness, man. What a haul for us. Let's start going through the rest of the league, see what some other good picks were. So the Padres got themselves three guys with high B potential here. Starting off with Samuel Cortez, 62 overall, 87 potential pitcher. First round pick. I think they're gonna be happy with that guy. Andrew Pennock. Not much of an arm, but he is left field and he can hit for contact and has play skills fielding. Honestly, pretty similar here to, uh, he's like a Kyle Brown offensively and a Brian Doe defensively is what you get here with Andrew Pennick. Good pick by the Padres. And then only 55 overall, but at reliever, that's less of an issue. 86 potential. Padres, killer draft here. And then the Giants, uh, not much going for them. I mean, this guy is pretty solid, Ken Mora. We didn't, uh, and then the last guys in our division would be the Diamondbacks. Dominique Flores, he was somebody we had on our board. 84 hits per nine is awesome. Uh, needs to develop pretty much everything else, but soft contact pitcher, really good in that area. 59 overall with 87 potential is also a pretty good pick here. Michael. Mullins, not a strikeout picker, pitcher at all, but um, also has low clutch. Still a solid guy here, five pitch mix. I think he'll come into play at some point here in the franchise. And then, ooh, 96 potential all the way down here. Ricky Sherry, these guys had a ton of picks. Mostly just a speed and defense guy for now, but with 96 potential, he's got a lot of room for growth. So I think our division had a pretty good draft. I think the Padres had the best draft after us, of course. We had, my goodness, I don't think I've ever drafted this well. Going around the league, let's see some other really good players. Armando Ortiz, gonna be a good closer for the Orioles. 
Jared McDaniel had some potential. 57 overalls. Not the worst starting spot. You're getting that kind of potential that late in the draft. Ronald Castillo. I thought he was the best pitcher in the class. He's 67 overall, 88 potential. So the exact same, you know, overall and potential as our guy that we got in the third. But um, McGaffick, he's just four years younger. And five pitch mix, really good. Strikeouts per nine at uh, 65 is really good. His lowest is his walks per nine, which is always not great, but it's 47, which is not in a bad spot at all. So I think an awesome pick here by Tampa Bay at pitcher. Uh, Morgan Villarreal. So he was somebody that you know, was going to have his injury affect his ratings. Looks like they didn't affect him that much at all. So he ends up being pretty good. I think... Yeah, these, these are well within what his rating was pre-injury. So the injury scared me off a bit. I also just thought, you know, Marilla was better. So I was never going to end up with Morgan Villarreal. But injury does not hurt this player. And he ends up being a really good pick for the Blue Jays. They also got Guyen here, who's a good reliever. Daly projects to be a really good defensive catcher one day. And they got another catcher with some upside. So solid class here from the Blue Jays for sure. Harmon here, 59 overall, 88 potential, solid pitcher. Um, couple solid guys here for the Guardians. Uh, this is the number one player in the class, by the way, 60 overall with 75 potential. I think you want to do better with number one in the draft. I'm just going to go out on a limb. So Richard Shen. Awesome power hitter, but doesn't really offer much else. He has decent speed as well. So I'm glad we end up finding that we ended up finding, you know, multiple players that we liked better than him. Newton Colligan, 64 overall with 87 potential. Good closer. England a solid pick there by the Athletics, Neil Hansen. Probably never going to get to his potential with how low his starting point is. Uh, solid shortstop here. Adrian Mesa, really good defender for sure. Don't know if that offense is ever going to come along by the Braves here. But they also had Kurt Kellenberger, who was on our board. 84 potential, 69 overall. I think you'll live with that for sure. Doesn't throw anything into the 90s, though. Video Fong, great name. Also, great contact hitter. This is a pretty good pick. Probably would have ended up on my board had I scouted him. But you can't scout everybody in the MLB show, which is part of the fun. Henry Tanana, 63 overall, 89 potential. This is the guy that our scout said was the second best player in the class. Just 27 hits per nine, 32 home runs per nine is scary. 83 walks per nine is absolutely elite. Ronaldo Heim has a long way to go, but projects to be a guy at first base that can eventually hit for good power and already a good fielder. So I think that could work out for the Phillies in the future if he develops well. And solid guy here, Ethan Shell. This is the 23 year old we were looking at in the draft. Excellent velocity, excellent stamina, excellent walks per nine. Needs to develop everything else. Rene Bautista was in the top five on our draft board. 67 overall with A potential. And yeah, especially hitting against righties, that's a future leadoff man for sure. Speed at 80, 85 steel, 81 contact, 73 vision, 66 discipline and clutch. One player cannot play a lick of defense. TJ Strange, a solid shortstop here. Good on base guy. They kind of got two. You can tell what they were looking for here in this draft. Israel Rivas, he was on my board. And he looks like a really solid player. Kind of needs all around help in his per nines, but he's got a long way to grow. To get that help that he needs, Reggie Chance. Here. 
Pretty good looking pitcher here for the Cardinals. Michael Mullins, 59 overall. Oh, we're back to the division. So we have officially looked at everyone. And not that I'm surprised by this at all, but our draft looks the best. And said it kind of at the end of last episode. I felt very prepared for this class. I felt like I had guys that I liked at all portions of the draft. I had early guys, you know, had a lot of options for three, 37 and 41. But like I had guys that would be there at 79 and 109, whatever our picks were. And then the last two picks, you usually don't have guys that you've scouted. We And we had Jeff Ramirez still available from the guys that we had scouted. So really, really, really happy with this draft. Let me know what you think of it and what you thought about maybe the class in general in the comments section below. I'm excited for this class to get into the organization next season. We're going to be blowing through the rest of this season in either one or two episodes, but let me know again what you thought of this class as well as who you think we should get in exchange for Nolan Jones next episode. That episode will be coming out soon, and I will see you then.